Well, hello, we're so glad um, we're here together today to worship. And um, let's just get started and confess the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
once again, we welcome you to our worship service. And if you need to make a quick trip over to the kitchen counter, feel free to do that. But we're awfully glad that you're with us here today. Are you ready for spring? Did you get out this afternoon a little bit and enjoy a little bit of that sunshine? A special welcome to all of you this evening and especially to our online worshipers as well. We're grateful that we can connect with our online worshipers this way also. I got out two times around the lake today. I think we're all ready for spring, and Cindy and I are all ready to enjoy the cherry blossoms in Korea and Japan this next week. This is a 39th anniversary tour that we're leaving on Wednesday four or five days in, in Korea, and then the rest of it in Japan. We've never been to Korea, but Cindy got her black belt in Taekwondo right over here on North Main, and Master So, her instructor, his older brother was the national champion of, 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 black, of uh, Taekwondo in Korea. So we got to be good friends, and he, came over on his honeymoon to visit us and to stay with us, and they've been eager to have us come over. And then also, I spent a month studying the religions of Japan in Kyoto in January of 1976. So I'm eager to go back to Japan after 40 years as well. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be exciting. And I noticed just this last week in the news, just like four days ago, the Prime Minister of Japan and the Prime Minister of, of Korea got together for a peace summit for the first time in 15 years, so I think that's a good sign. <laughs> I'm praying for peace while we're over there in that part of the world. I mentioned in my email the other day that we've been thrilled with our Lenten attendance this year on Wednesday evenings. Now, I think it's the soup. I'm, I'm sure the soup is, is playing a big, big role, the homemade soup, but perhaps more than that, I think after several years of COVID fears and COVID restrictions. I mean, even last year, we kind of didn't know if we could have the soup suppers. And so we had, we had Wednesday night cookies. And <laughs> I don't think that has, that doesn't have quite the pull as soup. So it's just good. And I think we're just coming back from all of this with more of a, with a deeper hunger for fellowship and for community. And that's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So we, we celebrate that. Those of you that have been with us at Wednesday nights and Jeannie, thank you for stepping in and playing the piano this last Wednesday. You did a beautiful job, just like you, uh, like getting back up on a bike, isn't it? We, I, I'm sure you practiced a little bit too. But as you know, that liturgy, which so many around here love so much, begins with the words, Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. If you read ahead our lessons for this weekend, Jesus makes that bold claim that he is the light of the world. Now, what was one of the most common titles that Jesus had in the Gospels? It was Jesus, son of David. Son of man, that's one of them. Son of God, yes, that's, that's the big one. But Jesus, son of David, was one of the more common titles as well. Let's take a look at how the story of David begins by turning to 1 Samuel chapter 16. This is found on page 396, where Samuel, Samuel the prophet, anoints David. This is a great story. If you love underdog stories, you got to love this story. Page 396, Samuel anoints David. And it begins in verse 1 saying, The Lord said to Samuel, I, and I won't read through all of this because it's a little, little bit, I can't read 16 verses, I don't think here, or 13 verses. But the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, that's King Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. Some of us are going to be in Bethlehem in October. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Do you think Samuel's excited about that? No. Take a look at verse 2. No. Samuel's not excited. How can I go? Saul, King Saul, will hear about it and kill me. And yet he obeys. And so as the story continues on, he goes to meet Jesse and Jesse's sons parade past Saul or past Samuel one by one. And surprise, surprise, it's not the big brother, it's not the second brother, it's not the third brother. Finally, Samuel says, don't you have any other sons? Well, yeah, there's David. He's out tending sheep. Well, bring David. And then look what it says in verse 13. It says, um, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed it, him in the presence of the brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to 
Ruma. But the verse that I want to focus on here tonight is verse 7, where it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So point number one for this, this weekend is this, that God looks us at us in a different light than the world does. Again, notice how scared Samuel is at the beginning of the story. He's scared to anoint someone else to, to be king. He's scared because he's going to get killed. In other words, he's in kind of a tight spot kind of a challenging spot, I think we could say kind of a messy spot as we continue our Life is Messy series. And I think one of, the, one of the lessons from here is this, that if you and I are waiting for that perfect peace before we step out in faith, we may wait a long time. And sometimes we think, oh yeah, I don't have a peace about this yet. Well, where, show me those stories in Scripture where people find a perfect peace and then they step out in faith. Most of the time, it's just the opposite, isn't it? They're stepping out in faith in fear and trembling. So you and I might feel the nudge of the Holy Spirit to, uh, say, serve in the community a, a bit more or to serve in the church a bit more. In the, back of our, in the back of our mind, in our heart, we're feeling a little tug. We probably should and could do a little more, but maybe we're a little hesitant and we're a little scared. You know, we're scared to make that sacrifice. We're scared to give up more of our time. Maybe we felt the tug of the Holy Spirit to be a bit more generous to practice first fruits giving as the Bible talks about first fruits giving or perhaps to even step out and tithe. And we know we wouldn't lose our house. We know that we wouldn't you know, end up on the street, but it would be a bigger sacrifice than we're willing to make. And that's a little scary. We don't have as much at stake as Samuel here, who was afraid that King Saul would kill him. And yet, Samuel obeys. He steps out in faith. That's really the biblical story over and over again, isn't it? Just as Samuel steps out in faith here, think of Noah. Think of all the doubts and fears Noah probably felt as he began to build the ark. Think of all the, the doubts and fears that, that Abraham probably had when God promised that he would become the father of a great nation while he and Sarah were old in age. Think of the doubts and fears that, that Moses felt at the burning bush. Think of the, the doubts and fears that, that later David must have felt facing the giant Goliath. I just finished up again reading Malcolm Gladwell's David and Goliath book that you guys gave me about five years ago, uh, Paul and Donna. It is, a, it is a wonderful book. Do you even remember giving me Malcolm Gladwell's David and Goliath. Oh, yeah, there's a nice note in the very front. I'm your favorite pastor, he said, in the front of the book. <laughs> Still, okay, glad, 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 glad to, glad to hear. That's, that's, that's nice to hear. Nice to hear. Big, big, big compliment. But think of the doubts and the fears that so many of the biblical characters must have felt in the midst of difficult situations, messy situations in life. So my question is this. How many people do you think throughout the course of history and in biblical times, maybe God had positioned for goodness or greatness in the kingdom of God, but they said no? I mean, maybe, just maybe, Noah wasn't the first person that God approached. I don't know. Is it possible that Noah was the, was the tenth that God approached to build an ark? The first nine said, no way. And Noah is the one who finally found the fear to say yes. And perhaps maybe even with Moses, we know all of his excuses at the burning bush. Maybe that wasn't the first burning bush. Maybe there were ten burning bushes to ten other guys. They all said, no way. Moses is the one who finally says yes and obeys. And the rest is history. I think this is a story that encourages us in the midst of our doubts and fears to say yes and to step out in faith. And if we ever have those moments where we might feel like the odds are against us, you got to love this story. I always love underdog stories here. It's pretty clear at the beginning of the story that even Samuel, who has been called by God 
to anoint the next king, he is surprised. He is surprised. He expected it would be one of Jesse's older sons. He is surprised, and Jesse, David's dad, is surprised as well. I think it's great that we have this story following Amy's story about Esther last week. And of course, you know the story at the end of Esther. Esther, uh, um, or Ruth, rather. Ruth ends up becoming the mother of Obed, who becomes the father of Jesse, who becomes the father of David. Surprise, surprise. Ruth, the Moabite, becomes a part of the lineage of David. God seems to enjoy surprises, doesn't he? The people that we would not expect, he picks. Abraham and Sarah in their older age. Little David here in this story. And that continues as a theme in the New Testament as well. Who would have guessed that God would choose a peasant girl to be the mother of the Son of God and a carpenter to be the stepdad of the Son of God and that fishermen, common fishermen, fishermen to be in Jesus' inner circle, and Paul, the fiercest persecutor and enemy of the early church, to then become the fiercest church planter in the first century of Christianity. Yes, God certainly loves surprises. And we see lots of underdog stories in the Bible. So for those moments where we may feel hesitant or feel like we don't have the training, or the talent, or the treasure, or the experience to qualify for serving for God, the Bible encourages us to remember that with God, all things are possible. Well, let's fast forward now, a thousand years from David to the time of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And the story that I asked you to read in my email this week was Jesus heals a man born blind, John 9. Now, this is, a, this is kind of a long story, 41 verses, but it's a great story. And I'll just begin with verse 1, which says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His parents asked him, Rabbi, who, or his, the disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus replied, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. If, and Jesus goes on then to heal the man. He spits in the, on the ground, made some mud. This sounds kind of gross. Put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. And, and so the man went and washed and came home seeing. If the story were in there, it would be a story that has a happy ending, right? But it goes on. This healing upsets who? It upsets the Pharisees, of course. So the next part, if your Bible's open, you can see the next title in the story is The Pharisees Investigate the Healing. And you, if you didn't read it before, go home and read it, okay? It's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. It's fascinating. The man born blind, they talk to first, and he says, well, I don't know who this guy is, but I just know he healed me. I, maybe he's a prophet. So they dismiss him, and then they call in his parents, and they start questioning his parents. His parents are more scared, I think, and they say, well, you, you know, you're asking us questions we can't answer. Go talk to our son. He's old enough to answer. By the second time they invite the blind man back, he's getting a little sassy. Did you notice that in the story? He's getting a little sassy, and he says, well, you, are you interested in becoming his followers as well? And they, they, get, they get mad at the end of that, and they say, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. And by the end of the story, he confesses in verse 38, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So the main point of this story, I believe, is this. The reminder, the truth, that Jesus is the light of the world. Now notice I said the light of the world and not one of many lights in the world. That's the direction a lot of people would like to take it. Jesus is a great man, a great person, a great light, a great prophet, a great healer, one of many great lights in the history of mankind. But Jesus makes a claim that's much bolder than that. He says, I am the light, the light of the world. One of the things that I think is wonderful about this story is the grace that Jesus shows and gives at the very beginning of the story. What's the question the disciples asked? Master or rabbi, who sinned 
this man or his parents that he was born blind? Now, that's kind of a strange question, isn't it? You wouldn't say that or think that if a neighbor, neighbor child was born blind. You wouldn't say, well, I wonder who's sitting there, mom, dad, grandpa, grandma. We wouldn't think that way, but that was the way the Jews thought in their theology, that, that, that when bad things happened, it was the result of somebody's sin. Now, it seems like kind of a silly question, really, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? I mean, how can a baby sin? I mean, did he sin on his way, way into this world? I mean, that, that seems dumb. But here's, here's the grace. The grace is verse 3, I think. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Well, I think the first part of, the, of, of Jesus' response here is the grace. Neither, neither sin. Neither, it was neither this man's sin. It wasn't his fault. They're looking for somebody, somebody to blame. This had to be somebody's fault. The good news is, Jesus says, no, it wasn't his fault. And it wasn't his parents' fault either. But I think we want to be careful with what Jesus says here. That is not to conclude, I think, that God caused this man to be born blind so that... You know, we could have this miracle to be talking about 2,000 years later today. I mean, I wouldn't think that way either, and I, I hope you wouldn't either. I mean, I wouldn't think that, that God caused my mom to have cancer and my dad to have cancer and me to have cancer and then Cindy to have cancer so that, you know, we could, we could talk about uh, how our faith grew. I think those are good things that did come out of it, but I don't think God caused it. Again, in terms of first causes, I think we can simply say this. And we learn this right away in chapter 3 of the, of the book of Genesis. Right at the beginning of the Bible, we learn about the fall of humankind. That we live in a fallen world where sin and Satan are alive and well. And sadly, that means bad things sometimes happen to good people. It's nobody's fault necessarily. I mean, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. It's the fall of human, humankind. So I think it's grace, because actually this blind man, think about it, with, with the Jewish theology that he'd been living with, he'd had a double burden in his life. I mean, it, wasn't it a burden enough to be a, born blind? That'd be a pretty big burden. But secondly, he had the burden of believing it was his fault, or it was his mom's fault. Or it was his dad's fault, or it was grandpa's fault, or grandma's fault. It was somebody's fault. Jesus just lifted that burden, and I think that is a gift of grace. Would you say that this is a story that teaches us that his faith made him well? It's a little bit of a tricky question. I don't know. How much faith does this guy have? I don't know. I don't know that he has any faith at the beginning of the story. T take a closer look at the beginning of the story. You know, they came upon, they saw a man blind from birth, and then um, the disciples and Jesus start talking about it, and apparently while they're talking about it, you know, the guy's, the poor guy's sitting there, standing there, and then verse 6 simply tells us, having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, tells the man to go wash and he came home seeing. So we, we, we don't know that this guy had any faith at all. He doesn't say anything in the beginning of the story. We, 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 he didn't ask to be healed. Jesus just happened to come along, saw him, and, and healed him. We don't see any faith from this man. I mean, even in the investigation with the, he, with the Pharisees, does he have faith there? Well, I mean, now he's got faith that Jesus was a healer, that Jesus, and, and he suggested maybe he's a prophet. But it isn't until the very end of the story, verse 38, that he, that he comes to faith in Jesus as the light of the world. Because verse 38 says, then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Um, verse 17 set, or 37 set, set up Jesus. You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. So I think that's good news to us in those moments where we may struggle with guilt that, you know, we don't have enough faith. If we had more faith, we'd be well. If we had more faith, our situation in life would be better. If we had more faith, things would just be smoother. Uh, not necessarily. I think at the end of the story, we see that health and healing are gifts of grace. 
Health and healing are gifts of grace, and let's give thanks for that. And by the end of the story, too, we see that there are different kinds of blindness. Now, I was working from a different Bible earlier this week, and the title of the second part of the story was Spiritual Blindness. I mean, the, the, the blind man is physically blind. But by the end of the story, we see that there is a blindness worse than physical blindness, and that is spiritual blindness. The Pharisees fail to see who Jesus really was. The Pharisees fail to see that he's the Son of God. They fail to see that he is the light of the world. They fail to see that he is the Messiah, the, the Christ, the Son of the living God. So at the end of the day, I think we would agree that that spiritual blindness is more serious even than physical blindness. Here's what's interesting. A surprising number of our hymns that have been beloved hymns in recent centuries were written by blind people. Blessed assurance written by a blind person. O oh, love that wilt not let me go written by a blind person. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care. Some of you remember that song, written by a blind person. What does that tell us? That you don't have to be able to see physically to be able to see spiritually. And what that tells us is that these people who wrote these hymns, even though they had a serious disability in their life, nevertheless, they also had a gift. They could see that Jesus was the light of the world. And they could see that Jesus brought light and life to them. Yes, the main point of this story is the good news in the midst of a messy world, in the midst of a world where there is a lot of darkness, you just have to watch the news to know there's a lot of darkness, is the good news and the truth that Jesus is the light of the world. And what a gift it is to know that and to believe that and to trust that when we encounter the darkness and the messiness of this world. Well, let's close with this, with the Apostle Paul, with Ephesians chapter 5. Paul was blind for a short period of time too. Do you remember that? When he was struck blind on the road to Damascus for a short period of time, what is it, about three days he struck blind. But he also knows he was blind spiritually for a long, long time. And he, he remembers that very, very well. So perhaps he was thinking of his own blindness physically and spiritually when he wrote these words in Ephesians 5 in verse 8, which says this, For you were once darkness... But now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. So let's end with that, that wonderful gospel invitation. Let's live as children of the light. We all love people that tend to light up the room. Can you think of somebody that in your life that just lights up the room? And Sandy's smiling there because she's one of those persons who just kind of lights up the room. I mean, how, how she just brings smiles whenever she, whenever she walks into the room. And, she's, and even though the tables are all scrunched up closer to the, to the front here because of the soup supper, trying to make more room on Sunday nights or Wednesday nights, Sandy's still sitting in the front here where she can harass me and, and heckle me a little bit with her smile and with her comments. But don't we love people that, that, that do light up the room? Sometimes it's their smile. Sometimes it's their sense of humor. Sometimes it's the twinkle in their eyes. Sometimes it's just the quiet warmth they bring or the sense of hospitality they bring that they show an interest in us. So Paul here invites us to live as children of the light. And he goes on to say after verse 8 in verse 9, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord, he says. He goes on, and I love this, particularly in verse 19. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to the Lord, the, to God the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's what we're doing tonight, isn't it? We're, we're, we're singing spiritual songs. We're, we're singing hymns, just as Paul has invited us to do here. So let us live as children of the light. Arguably, probably no one has brought the light of the gospel to more people in the last half a century or more than Billy Graham. 
Don't you think? I mean, he's brought the light of the gospel to, to millions around the world. Last Sunday morning in Bruce's Sunday school class, I popped in to say hi to people. And, and Dwayne Sharp handed me a, a story about Billy Graham, who, when he was 86 and suffering from Parkinson's, get, once gave a speech. And at the beginning of his speech, he said he was reminded of the, the great Dr. Albert Einstein, who was once on a train when all of a sudden he realized to his dismay that he had missed placed his ticket for that for that particular trip. So when the conductor came along, he was very, very embarrassed. And the conductor said, put a kind hand on his shoulder and said, don't worry, Dr. Einstein. We all know who you are. Don't worry about it a bit. So the conductor continued down the, down the aisle there collecting tickets. When he turned around, he was surprised to see Dr. Einstein on the floor, on his hands and knees, still searching for his ticket. And so he went back to him. And again, he put his hand kindly on his shoulder and he said, Dr. Einstein, don't worry about your ticket. We all know who you are. Dr. Einstein looked up at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> Billy Graham went on to say, the good news is I still know who I am. And the good news is I know where I'm going. Amen. The good news is because Jesus is the light of the world, we too know where we're going. So let's live as children of the light and let's share the light and let's let, let's let our light shine as we give thanks for God's amazing grace to us who once were blind, but now we see. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we continue our Lenten journey to the cross, the shadow of the cross begins to loom larger and larger as Holy Week approaches. And we, we give thanks in the midst of this world where there is a lot of darkness, a lot of sadness, a lot of messiness. We give thanks for that powerful truth that you are the light of the world and that you, you look at us in a different light than the world does. We might be insignificant and, and, and the little guy and the weak guy and the outsider to, to others, but, but you see the gifts that you've given us. You see the potential that we have to, to spread light and love. Help us to remember in our moments of doubt that with you all things are possible. So help us live as light. Help us as a church to, to proclaim that light loudly, boldly, and brightly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now share in a time of holy communion together. And I think one of the great things about worshiping together online is that you don't have to be in person here to take communion. You can take it where, wherever you're at. And so I invite you now, if you're at your house or, or uh, you're out at a restaurant somewhere watching this, uh, wherever you're at, to grab some wine, some grape juice, crackers, bread, uh, and let's share in a time of communion together as a church family. Let us now hear and receive these promises to us. It was on the night in which Jesus was betrayed that he gathered with his disciples. He took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it for all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now take and eat Christ's body, broken for you. Again, after the supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant that was shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Now take and drink Christ's blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. I invite you now to join with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you for worshiping with us today. So let's close with this blessing. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. If you're new to us here at Faith Community, we'd encourage you to check out our website. You know how to use Google, don't you? Just say to Google, Faith Community Lutheran Church. And be careful, it's not Faith Community Lutheran Church, Las Vegas, Nevada. There is a, Las, there is a Faith Community in Las Vegas, Nevada. We have discovered this week. Faith Community Lutheran Church, Longmont, Colorado. And if you haven't connected with us, it's very easy right on the front page of our website to hit connect and to fill in your personal information so we can get to know you a little bit better. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for worshiping with us. God bless. Have a nice week.